Hello and welcome to the New Line Guide to Full Stack Comments with Kasura and GraphQL. I'm Alexandra and I was previously a tech lead at Kasura and currently I'm leading the development of Blitz.js. So, what is the course about? In this course, we're going to explore how to implement a commenting system and add it to a website. Along the way, we're going to learn about databases, GraphQL, Asura, building UI components with React and TypeScript, and a few other things. You may wonder why comments? Many developers would like to add a comment section for their websites or blogs to gather feedback from their visitors. While it's possible to use existing hosted solutions, they are mostly paid and impose their fixed UI. We also have little to no control over it. Another option is building it from scratch. And this is what we're going to do in this course. By the end, we'll have a commenting system added to a website and comments stored in a database managed by Hasura. We'll also publish the fetching and adding comments logic as a library to NPM. What is this course mission? The goal of this course is to empower front-end developers to build their own full-stack solutions. By teaching how to add a comments widget to a website, we strive to make this knowledge transferable to other similar problems that require a database and integration from a front-end application. This course is split into four modules. In the first module, we're going to explore how to add a Hasura instance, how to work with GraphQL, and how to integrate with Hasura from the front-end application. In the second module, we're going to implement a comment system in a front-end application. In the third module, we're going to extend our implementation and add more functionalities. In the last, fourth module, we're going to publish a library to NPM and we're going also to add various customization. Our tech stack is as follows. On the front end, we have React and TypeScript. We'll be implementing Commons UI and backend integration logic in a React application written in TypeScript. For the database, we're going to use Postgres. And this is where we'll be storing our comments. For the backend, we're going to use Hasura, which will generate GraphQL APIs from the database. And GraphQL, so as I mentioned before, Hasura generates GraphQL APIs, so we're also going to use GraphQL from the frontend to communicate with Hasura. Who is this course for? This course is for React developers who want to learn how to add full stack components to their websites. This course assumes a basic React knowledge. You should be fairly familiar with React components and be confident in implementing them. You also should be familiar with use state and use effect React hooks. So let's get started. See you in the next lesson. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or if you want to leave us some feedback, please join us on Discord in the New Line channel. See you soon. Hello and welcome to our first lesson. In this lesson, we'll cover the basics of GraphQL, we will learn what it is and how to use it, and we'll also understand how it fits the course's subject. In the course introduction, we mentioned that we're going to use a Postgres database to store our comments. In our application, we need to be able to do two things. The first one is adding new comments. We want to insert new entries to the database. The second thing is displaying them in the UI. We want to extract the comments from the database. But how exactly do we communicate with the database from a front-end application? That's where Hasura comes into play. It will generate GraphQL APIs from a database and that way from the front-end will communicate with Hasura through GraphQL and beneath Hasura will handle accessing the database. And since we're going to use GraphQL, let's first talk about it a bit. From the official GraphQL documentation, we know that GraphQL is a query language for APIs and also it's a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. It provides a complete and understandable description of the data in your API, it gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. It also makes it easier to evolve APIs over time and enables powerful developer tools. When we're working on an application that requires resources stored in a database, we don't directly access the database from the front-end code. We have a server for it. The client sends requests to the server to fetch or modify data. The server handles these requests, accessing the database and possibly performing some additional business logic. Then it returns a result to a client. It can be, for example, a list of items that the client application wanted to fetch or a message that the request was successful. 
If something goes wrong, the server will return an error message. A common way to handle client-server communication, and you already might be familiar with it, is using REST APIs. Let's quickly take a look at it. With REST APIs, client sends a request to a particular endpoint to access a particular resource. It needs to be sent using an HTTP method expected by the server, get, post, put, patch, or delete. The request body and the response format are usually agreed upon between the frontend and the backend team, and the latter is implementing and exposing APIs that the frontend application can use. In this example REST API, you have three endpoints that accept get HTTP method. The first one returns a list of users, the second one can return a single user if you provide an ID, and in case you need more details of a user, you can use user details endpoint. Also, if you want to create a new user, you can send a POST request to a user endpoint. Now let's move to GraphQL. A GraphQL server exposes only one endpoint and it accepts only POST requests. The body of the request is expected to be a stringified JSON object that contains a query and variables property. Here's an example. Query is a request written in GraphQL language and variables is an object of values that you can use in the request. It's optional and you can use it to pass some dynamic data to your query. Let's take it bit by bit. GraphQL schema. The core part of a GraphQL server is a GraphQL schema. It describes the data and functionalities available to the client applications. For example, for a GraphQL server created on top of a database with a single table users, the schema could look like this. We can see a query type with field users. And we know that if we use query users, we'll get an array of objects of type user. The type user is described below. It has an ID, name, and age. This schema also tells us what types we can expect for particular fields. Hence, we know that the returned name will always be a string and age will be an integer and so on. Our tooling can use this knowledge to generate types for the GraphQL API. For example, GraphQL code generator generates TypeScript types based on your schema. GraphQL query. To get data from a GraphQL service, we use a query. We construct it by specifying the root type, for example, user, and all the fields we want from the type. For example, the server exposes fields ID, name, and age. But maybe we don't need all of them. One of the core concepts of GraphQL is the take which you want approach. What does it mean? It means we can ask for exactly what we need. Let's say we only want user IDs. In that case, we can only specify ID field of the user type and nothing more and the GraphQL server will only retur return user IDs. It won't return name and age. Example queries can look like this. All of them are valid and all of them mean the same thing. This is a request that the client application would send. You can see a JSON post body with a query field and a stringified GraphQL query. We can also pass variables. Let's say you want to fetch a particular user based on the user ID. In that case, we can pass an additional variables field with a specified ID property. We can also provide a name for the query, which accepts a dynamic ID value, which then will be used in the query itself. In the next lesson, after we set up Hasura, we will play a bit with trying out GraphQL queries. GraphQL mutation. When we need to modify data, we're using mutations. With a GraphQL mutation, we can update one or more objects. Take a look at the following example. We're using create user mutation exposed from a GraphQL server. We pass dynamic values for a new user's name and age, and we also return an ID of a newly created user. It means that the mutation can not only be used to modify underlying resources, but we can also get some results back. GraphQL subscription. Sometimes you may need real-time data. For example, you're building a chat application and you need to display up-to-date content. 
With GraphQL, we can subscribe to a real-time data from a server by using subscriptions. They have the same format as queries, with the only difference being a subscription keyword instead of a query. The subscription API is exposed over WebSockets. Hence, we need to hit a WebSocket URL from a client. It means that instead of sending requests to the server on HTTP or HTTPS, we need to use a WebSocket protocol. Many GraphQL clients have built-in support for handling subscriptions. Client integration. As we mentioned before, sending GraphQL requests is no more than sending POST requests over HTTP to an endpoint. For this reason, on the client, we can use built-in browser APIs. However, the GraphQL ecosystem is quite interesting, and there are multiple clients. For example, Apollo Client, Relay, or URQL. They provide cache support, subscription support, improve the developer experience by abstracting an integration layer, and more. In case of bigger applications, it generally may be a good idea to use a GraphQL client. Why GraphQL? GraphQL is a very convenient way to work with JSON data. It can be used with any language or framework. It's not tied to any specific database, and on top of that, it has an excellent ecosystem and a huge community. GraphQL is statically typed, so as a front-end developer, we always know what to expect from the backend. What's more, GraphQL is introspective. We don't have to ask a server team about an API and its details. We can ask a GraphQL server for information about the supported queries. We can do it by using the introspection system. We can gain a lot of flexibility by using GraphQL. Instead of waiting for a new endpoint whenever we need to fetch a different set of data, we can handle it independently by writing an adequate query based on our specification. We also don't have to send multiple endpoints to fetch the information. We can handle it in one GraphQL query. Congratulations! You just learned the basics of GraphQL. It's a lot of new knowledge, but don't worry. We'll play a bit with queries and mutations in the following lesson so that you'll have a chance to try different functionalities and experiment a bit with GraphQL. See you soon. Hi, and welcome to our next class. In this lesson, we're going to learn about Hasura and play a bit with its features and writing GraphQL queries and mutations. This knowledge will let us move on to the commenting system. So let's get started. As we mentioned in the previous lesson, Hasura can generate GraphQL APIs from our database. It means that we don't have to build a GraphQL server on our own. Hasura connects to a database or other GraphQL services and provides us with a GraphQL API. In this lesson, we're going to explore basic Hasura's functionalities and see them in action. Under the hood, Hasura compiles a GraphQL query into a single SQL query. We introduced new words, so let's quickly see what they mean. An SQL stands for Structured Query Language, and it's a query language for managing data held in a database. A compiler is a program translating code written in one programming language into another language. In our case, the first language is GraphQL and the output language is SQL. You can take a look at the following example and for a query that takes users, their related posts and tags, it converts to a single SQL query, which joins tables, users, posts, and tags, and takes the required data. The SQL query is not 100% exactly what's going to be generated by Hasura, but it's more or less what is going to happen. Hasura has an analyzer tool that will let you see the exact query generated from a GraphQL one. Hasura comes with more features other than automatic GraphQL API ge generation. In this course, we're going to learn about role-based permission systems, and it will let us protect our data and restrict access to it. Let's spin up a new Hasura project. There are various ways to have our own Hasura instance. We can self-host it, deploy it to any platform we wish, for example, Heroku, DigitalOcean, and so on. Or we can use Hasura Cloud, which offers hosting for the Hasura projects and takes care of managing the infrastructure for us. We will use the second option in this course, as it's the most straightforward one, and their free tier covers all of our needs to implement the commenting system. To create a new project, we need to visit Hasura Cloud dashboard. You will need to create a new account first. 
You can sign up with GitHub, Google, or using email and password. I'm already signed up, so please pause for a second to create the account and see you in a bit. After successfully logging into the cloud dashboard, you will see that Hasura already created a new project for you so that we can get started even faster. When you click on the new project, it will open a new page with its details. On the main screen, there is a basic project information including the GraphQL endpoint URL and so on. On the left sidebar navigation, we can see collaborators, we can invite other people to our project, environmental variables, if needed, we can update environmental variables, for example, if we need to enable or disable some Hasura features controlled via Enverse. There's also a domain section. We can connect the project to a domain that we own. There's a usage. It provides basic project usage metrics and integrations. It allows us to integrate our project with monitoring systems like Datadog or Neural. In the right top corner, there's a launch console button. Clicking it opens a Hasura console application. It's an admin dashboard to configure the database and additional Hasura features. In other words, it's a UI for the underlying backend responsible for generating the GraphQL APIs. In our newly created project, we don't have any database connected yet. However, Hasura provides us with a one-click Heroku integration, which will create a database for us. And then Hasura console will take care of connecting it to Hasura backend. When you click on the Data tab in the top navigation bar, Hasura Console will take you to the Connect Database section. Let's click the Create Heroku Database tab and then the big button with the Heroku logo. This step will require having an account on Heroku. If you don't have one, you can quickly create it for free. When the new database has been created and connected to our Hasura, we can see it displayed on the left sidebar with the name default. Below in the tree, we can see a public schema. What is a schema? You can think of schemas as folders containing database objects such as tables, views, functions, indexes, and so on. For a new database, Postgres automatically creates a default schema named public. Since we haven't added any new objects yet, we can see it as an empty folder in the Hasura console. Let's click on the Create Table button and add our first table. Clicking on the Create Table button opens the form when we need to provide a few pieces of information. The first one is Table Name. I will go with Users, but feel free to provide any name that you want. This is our test table, so it doesn't matter what name it has. Then we have Columns. We need to specify what data we want to store in this table. The first one that I'm adding is an ID column. I want each user to have a unique ID assigned. Since my table is called Users, I will also add name and age columns. From the column type dropdown, you can choose from a set of available types. The next part is setting a primary key. By specifying it, we'll let Postgres know which columns should be used as a unique identifier of the table's records. We're going to skip the remaining fields right now, as they are not mandatory, and we'll click the Add Table button. After submitting the form, we will be redirected to the tables page. The GraphQL APIs to query and change data are already generated. Hasura did it out of the box when we created the table. On the tables page, we can see multiple tabs. The first one, Browse Rows, displays the data in the underlying table. We don't have any data yet, so it's empty. We can add new rows using the GraphQL API, or we can use the Hasura console UI to do it. Let's go with the second option right now to get ourselves more familiar with the console application. We need to go to the Insert Row tab and fill a few inputs with the data we want to insert. I will create a few sample users. You can click Save and then you will go back to the Browser Rows tab and see the data appear there. As we added new records to the table, we can now try out the GraphQL API and perform some queries to retrieve the data. We can do it from the Hasura console if we go to the API tab in the top navigation. In there, we can see a GraphQL IDE, and on the left side, there's a GraphQL Explorer. We can use it to construct queries interactively. Remember what I mentioned in the previous lesson about GraphQL being introspective and different tools leveraging it to generate types? GraphQL Explorer and GraphQL IDE are taking advantage of it as well. 
That's how the former knows what checkboxes and inputs to render and the latter gives us fully fledged auto-completion. Going back to our data, let's write a sample query to fetch users from the database. However, I'm interested only in a user with a particular ID. That's why I'm constructing the query to take a variable. After writing the query, I can click the play button and see the results on the right side. I'd like to encourage you to pause for a bit and try a few more queries yourself. Take your time and play around with GraphQL. Let's move on to mutations for a moment. Previously, we were using the Hasura console to insert entries to the database. Now we can do it with GraphQL. We can use the Explorer to create a mutation or we can type it manually. This is how the mutation could look like. I will pass page and name to the mutation and return all of the table's fields. Here, I also encourage you to pause and write different mutations. You can insert some more data or you can edit the existing data. I want to show you one more thing. Hasura provides a permission system. Access rules are role-based, meaning we can set up different privileges for different roles. For example, admin, viewer, editor, and so on. They can be set for particular tables and actions, like insert, update, select, and delete. There are two types of permissions. Row level, you can restrict access to particular rows in a database. For example, when you want a user to only access rows where the row ID matches the user ID. Column level, we want to restrict access to particular columns. Let's try it out. We need to go back to the tables page and navigate to the permissions tab. In this example, we will create a row viewer and configure its select permissions. Let's select without any checks options for row level permissions, and that will mean that the user will have access to all rows. For column level access, we will select only the name column. We want users with row viewer only to see users' names and not see their ID and age. After saving the permissions, let's go back to the APA page and set a new header X Hasura role to viewer. Right after the new header is added, the content of the graphical explorer changed. We no longer see ID and age columns and we are no longer able to perform mutations. Since we only configured select permissions for a role viewer, it can only query data and it can't perform any modifications of the data. In this and the previous lesson, we covered the basics of GraphQL and Hasura. We played a bit with Hasura's features and writing GraphQL queries. It will let us move on to our commenting system. In the next lesson, we're going to create a comments table and set permissions to it. See you soon. Hi, welcome to the third lesson. In the previous lessons, we covered GraphQL basics and we learned about Hasura. We also created a new Hasura project and played a bit with its functionalities. In this lesson, we're going back to implementing the commenting system. We will use the project created in the previous class and create the comments table there. This is an example comment form to help us visualize what data we need to store in the database. It has two inputs to get information from a user and the submit button. Let's look at the form and list down what columns we need in the comments table. The first one is author. Comments author identifier. It could be a name, email, or however a user would like to introduce themselves. We could go more granular here and create separate columns like name, surname, and email, but a single column uh, with the author name is good enough for now. Then the second field is content, and that will be the comments message. These two columns are the data from the form, and that could be enough in our database. However, we may need a bit more. For example, created at column, date at which the comment was added. It will be important for us to sort the comments by the posting date. The value can be sent from the frontend application or generated by the database. Topic, identifier of the post or another content that was commented on. Imagine that you have a blog and users can add comments to each blog post. You need a way to identify which comments belong to a particular post. By storing the topic ID, the comment is assigned with a particular reasons. For example, blog post. 
An example of a topic could be my post about cats. Now let's go back to our Hasura project and go to the create table page. We're going to fill the form with the information about columns. We need to provide column names and column types. For columns author, content and topic, we'll go with type text, which allows storing strings of any length. The created at column can be created by using frequently used types dropdown. We can also manually provide the type as timestamp and the default function as now. That will tell Postgres to insert a current timestamp for every new row. This way, the database will handle date in this column for us, and we won't have to send it from the front-end application. To create a table in Hasura, we also need a primary key, a unique identifier of every row. We could possibly use a multi-column key consisting of created at and outer, but there would be a possibility of duplicates because we don't ensure unique author names. We don't have their IDs, we only have pseudonyms, and two people with the same pseudonym could insert a comment at the same time. Let the database handle it for us and generate unique IDs for each row. We'll use auto increment integer type by selecting it from the frequently used types dropdown. Now let's click the add table button and our table will be created in a few seconds. Let's go to the permissions tab. Access to the Hasura instance and underlying database is protected. It requires an admin secret and Hasura will reject requests without it. However, on our website, we want authorized users to add comments. We also want them to be able to see the comments. Hence, we need a way to be able to retrieve and modify data without authentication. For that, we have to do two things. We have to create a new role with specific permissions. We did something similar in the previous lesson. We need that role to access comments and insert new comments. The second thing is that we have to do is we need to tell Hasura that this is a special role that doesn't require authentication. Let's start with the first item. We need to go to the tables permissions page and configure select and insert access. For select, we will choose No Checks option for row-based authentication and allow access to all the columns. We also need access to make aggregate queries, for example, count to, to show the number of all the comments. This will let the front-end application perform count operations to retrieve the number of all the comments. This information will be useful when implementing pagination. The second thing is insertion permissions. Same as for select, we'll go with no checks for row access, and for column access, we'll select only author, content, and topic, since the database handles ID and created that for us. Now what we need to do is go to Hasura Cloud Dashboard to set a new environmental variable and let Hasura know that this role doesn't require authentication. In the project details view, we need to go to the nvars tab and then click the new nvar button. The variable that we have to set is called Hasura GraphQL Unauthorized Role. We can select it from the dropdown. And of course, we're setting it to the previously created role, Anonymous. We are all set. Great job. The backend part of our work is done. We're moving to the frontend part in the following module and we'll be integrating to our Hasura instance, we'll be implementing the UI and the custom React hook. See you in the next module.